Welcome to the Anatomy of Therapy. Uh, I'm John Sobolski here with Bobby Riley. Today we are going over shoulders, more specifically shoulder impingement. Now, if you've listened to us before, you know that we're not just going to talk about shoulder impingement. We might talk about, I don't know, we could talk about anything, but today shoulder impingement. Um, Bobby, why, why shoulder impingement? Does it hold a special place in your heart? No. <laughs> Not at all, <laughs> but it's so common. I feel like we should cover it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you get a lot of shoulder impingement, or I mean, you know, do you see it walk into your office that much? I do see it walk into the office for sure. Uh, shoulder impingement's a big one, but I've I've reached out and worked with CrossFit or Olympic lifters for quite a long time now, so it could it could be more than the average clinician sees based on just the demographic demographic that I work with. I don't work with a lot of CrossFitters, honestly. I mean, I work with a good amount, I think less than you, but I still honestly have diagnosed impingement uh, quite a bit. I mean, it's, it's pretty common out there. Um, but yeah, wh wh why do you think CrossFitters more so than, you know, maybe versus general pop? Um, well, there's a few reasons for that. And I'm actually giving a seminar this week. So I'm doing a little bit of research and I came across the, the, at least what's out there, um, on CrossFit itself, studies done on CrossFit. Most of them are done in Europe or the Netherlands, things like that, that came up with, uh, they all came up with the same conclusion observationally that the shoulder was the number one most injured thing in CrossFit more than the low back, more than knee, more than uh, Achilles tendons or whatever else, wrists, I think, none of them. So shoulder was number one. Um, so that's a strong indicator of why, why I'm seeing a lot of them. Sure. But I mean, what does the average person do? Even if they're active, you know, they're, even if they go for runs and they play with their kids, they're not propelling themselves up onto their hands and doing handstand push-ups for the first time in their entire life at 38 years old. So, right. you know what I mean? You're, the general population, although it's still, like you said, it's quite common. Like you still see it a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. you definitely don't have to be a CrossFitter to get shoulder issues. But right. I think you just, I always talk about this idea of like capacity and load. And the you just have to, your capacity has to always be a, greater than the load for you to tolerate it and capacity is relative to the tasks you do if you're if you just want to be an esports person uh and be the world's best Fortnite player which is super cool uh your capacity in for shoulder overhead movement does not have to be very high right and you're going to be just fine but you still have to have the capacity to put on a coat and occasionally reach overhead and put your bag up into the overhead bin in an airplane and do you know reach back and take take something out of your kids hands in the back seat because they're they're goofing off you still have to have a minimal level of capacity in that shoulder so it'll it'll still creep in into gen pop yeah i mean that the only other thing that i obviously that i would add besides loading capacity which is, are the two main ones are is a skill is just a random skill and that obviously goes with a lot of crossfitters and i would say as your load is increasing and meeting getting closer to your capacity i would say that that skill is kind of going the opposite direction so you know people know how to lift weights people know how to pick up their kid you know lift groceries and stuff like that uh, but as that load increases, your, your skill very commonly starts to go the opposite direction. So you just start to have a, a higher and higher chance to move kind of funky, if you will. Um, that's really the only, and, 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 and if your capacity is kind of low and then you're, you know, and a guy this week that was like, he said he was raking his yard and he was trimming branches, you know, in his, in his tree. And so he he, do, he doesn't have a lot of capacity for overhead stuff, um, but he was just clipping some you know low hanging branches on his trees in his yard, and got his shoulder kind of angry. So, yeah, 
load capacity and then skill skill much more less so than the first two i would say but yeah no it's a super good point i'm glad you brought it up but i do agree with the last thing you said which is to a much less extent even on something like a snatch which is very technical and demanding uh, most of the time though you could if they have really good you know stability and mobility in the shoulder and the shoulder blade and in the neck and in the rib cage and in the t-spine they can handle some air in their skill and they don't break uh that's the, that's the robustness of of joint and movement variability that's the whole that's what we've been talking about for the past few weeks like this idea that if you have movement variability available to you and it's strong this is this is Again, we hit on FRC a lot, but their, their whole goal is to make you strong in these kind of weird ranges. Not weird, but sometimes weird. Uh, ranges that you're typically not getting into so you can tolerate them. You know, Doing a squat on the outside of your feet. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, right. have you seen them do this where they're completely yeah, yeah, yeah. inverted or supinated and do a squat. Uh -huh. Well, they just want to make sure that their lateral ankle ligaments and stabilizers are strong enough to handle that mistake. Right. Yeah. Which is hard to fault them for that. No, absolutely. Uh, that doesn't, for some people, they're like, I don't see why that would pertain to real life. But if your foot starts to give out and maybe you do sprain your ankles commonly, maybe you prepare yourself and put yourself in that situation. I remember a long time ago, as really early before his kind of rise recently, Ido Portal kind of had his little famous YouTube video where he was kind of standing up on a table giving an explanation about being strong at end ranges and training in the weird positions because that's how life is, right? And he's standing up on the table in front of, you know, a dozen people, it looks like a CrossFit box or something. Then he jumps down off the table and lands on the outside of his ankles where they would sprain, but he just keeps talking. And he walks on the outside of his ankles, both of them like that. And people are like, Ugh! but he just keeps walking and going. And he's like, so if you prepare for these things, then you're just ready for whatever life throws at you. And so I appreciate that. It takes a while to hear, like, that is that is a lot of dedicated movement pra practicing that he does, obviously. Yeah. But for, like, general CrossFitters, general population, like, what are you trying to do to build some resiliency? It, it maybe, maybe I've had some shoulder impingement before, you know, uh, and I'm, maybe I'm kind of through it, you know, it, or just nags from time to time, it's not a big deal. What are your kind of go-to ways to try to build in some variability and capacity in that shoulder? Well, I think before, before that, just so people don't go jump off tables onto the oh, side of their yeah. ankles, I just wanted to clarify that some of these guys, they had, you know, Spina, uh, Portal, these guys are not Hopfler Bjornsson. They're not the 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 mountain from game of thrones you know what i mean no. they are they are not big dudes they are smaller in stature which sure. you know you can handle that load a little bit better and they didn't do it overnight so just so you know it's it's a thing that's over time and for the right build and for the right you know that kind of stuff but anyway just just a little aside fair 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 well you know when we did our 20 questions you asked me what was a clinical insight that was somewhat recent for me. And I mentioned scapulas and through my career, this is like, it's like the idea of is a, our eggs nutritious for us. I feel like every year I read an article that just refutes the previous year. It's like salt's good. Salt's bad. Salt's good. Salt's bad. Eggs are good. Eggs are bad. Eggs are good. You're going to die. Right. Uh, butter kills you. Butter kills you. Actually, please eat butter. Margarine's the devil. Right. Right. Um, and I, I feel like, scapular dyskinesia is like one of those things in our in our world at least you know the things that i've come across since i've been a clinician is this really matters we need to watch people put their arms over their head and notice the dyskinesia notice how it doesn't move right check how it you know moves improperly or wings too much or doesn't elevate as much as it should and then the next year it was like nobody can measure dyskinesia of the scapula and dyskinesia is normal it's, it's like there's a million people that, well, I don't know how many, but a lot of people that have won the Olympics and running and none of them run the same. And some of them have quite, let's say contrary to textbook uh, advice, bad, you know, bad running mechanics, but they won the race. 
So then you, then the next year it's like, no, 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 this matters. So it's like, what, how do we ever know what's right sometimes? Right. Um, and this is a little bit where your own anecdotal clinical expertise does matter. Now, does that mean you're always going to come to the right conclusion over years? Absolutely not. But in my mind, something that I look for is when the shoulder blades are not on the rib cage. And in the past, I would, I was, I, I, I always go more towards the skeptic camp. I'm always more like, yeah, we probably can't measure it. We don't know if it's important or not. So I'm not really going to look at it at the dyskinesia. But mm -hmm. even without the, the kinesia part, without the movement part, shoulder blades that are not sitting on rib cages are like blinking lights for me now. They are giant yellow flags to say, look at this and see what it's affecting. Now, if somebody comes in and I can just, you know, put them in all fours and have dinner on their T-spine, yeah. And the shoulder blades are flying off there like they have long thoracic nerve palsy. Well, then, <laughs> well, I'm going to ask them any of the following questions, which is, do you have headaches? Do you have upper traps that feel like you need a massage all the time? Do you feel sh like pinching in your shoulder when you go overhead? Do you feel more clicking and popping on one shoulder than the other? Do you notice, uh, you know, crampy or achy pain in the back of your shoulder or in your lat or something like that and nine times out of ten they will have some symptom like that uh compared to the person who does not have that build for example uh it, comparatively it's quite noticeable and this is something i don't have the research to back this up this is just my observation and when i see it i ask those questions and they tend to always go actually yeah that my traps always feel hard and tight and i yeah, I deal with headaches, you know, one or two a week and it's at the base of my head. And um, so that's like, honestly, one of the first very simple things I look at. That doesn't tell you how I would treat it or what we should do from there, but it is right. a big yellow flag. Got it. So, so like, okay, so the head, like headaches, how are headaches related to these shoulder blades, man? <laughs> well, well, the upper trap, uh, well, it, it attaches primarily to the clavicle instead right. of the shoulder blade. But it's still, it's, if, if the upper trap is trying to elevate your arm, because, for example, you have a lower border that's winging off the shoulder blade, uh, or, sorry, off the rib cage, so you have this lower border winging, you are giving the advantage uh, of leverage and strength to the upper trap at this point, and to the pec minor, and chicken or the egg, it doesn't matter. At this point, you're stuck in this pattern. Maybe the lat is also concomitantly on. So you got a upper trap tugging with a lat, whatever it is. And the, and the upper trap attaches just, just inferior and lateral to the EOP, the, you know, the protuberance in the back of our head. Um, that's just one. I mean, there's, there's yeah, levators, yeah. there's scalenes, there's the suboccipital group. I mean, man, uh, headaches are, are a different topic, but. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, so yeah, so I get it. So, so the bottom of the scapula is tipping up. We're giving the mechanical leverage, the upper trap, the, the occipital muscles, pec minor, kind of pick your poison in that sense. Um, isn't that just bad posture? Am I just stuck in bad? Like I just, if I just had better posture all day, you know, if I just kind of pulled my shoulders back, wouldn't that, wouldn't that kind of fix that? Oof. If you pull your shoulders back, honestly, it's just worse. And I think this is, this is where it comes from sometimes is because uh, you have to, it, it can be that the shoulder blade is tipping on the rib cage, or it can be that the rib cage is disappearing away from the shoulder blade. In that cage, in, in that case, the rib cage and the spine is moving forward for some reason, right? It's it's like how you would look if you were, you know, your spine would look if you were doing an overhead lift. It's extended almost, right? But it's moving forward. So a lot of these people who have, let's say, horrible posture, I will, I, I'm going to ask you if you see this too, but I, I often see the person who's super slumped, kind of, I call it Netflix position. And then yeah. they, they get up and they are more of the extended person pinching their shoulder blades back, tilting their pelvis too much because 
often these horrible postures, which I, I'm a little on the layman side, they don't always mean anything to me. But if your posture is so terrible that it that you don't actually build any stability and strength through the muscular system, um, you will tend to load the skeletal system to find support, whether that's pushing your knees back into full extension so your quads don't have to work, whether it's uh, tilting your pelvis forward so you can hang out on your lumbar spine and your abs don't have to work, uh, whatever it is. Um, so I often see those same people sitting in Netflix positions stand up and then go default into an extended stance posture that leads to this problem. And what are, what are they doing in Netflix position is, you know, shoulders forward. So you get leverage to the like pec minor, pec major, whatever, lat, things that are, you know, internally rotating the shoulder and, and, uh, and the shoulder blade. And then they stand up and they pull everything back because there's no strength back there. So they're, they're doing it by shifting their center of mass forward, not so much, you know, uh, retracting their shoulder blades. Do you see that yeah, too? I, no, I think I 100%. I mean, I do think that people rest on their bones more than relying on their supportive muscular structure to kind of balance that out. Like if you're just kind of banging on your joints, like hanging out on one end, sometimes I'll, it's easy to picture if you're kind of standing, just somebody kind of standing on one hip. You know, that one hip is kind of jutting out to the side, the femur and the pelvis, or you're just kind of resting on that little bone, right? You're not really using the stability of your body to kind of hold you somewhere between either end of your bony structures. And so you have Netflix kind of bad postures in the front, and then they immediately kind of go all the way to the back and overextend. So it can be, uh, it can be tricky to look at, especially for new clinicians, old clinicians as well. I mean, even if you're stuck telling people to have just have better posture, then immediately in people's minds, they think, oh, I need to pull my shoulders back and tuck my head and get real tall. And, and that's just, you know, the ditch on the other side of the road as well, rather than some nice kind of neutral ground. Now, there is also a thing, I don't think you, you know, maybe parents shouldn't beat their kids up as much. There's a difference between posture and etiquette, right? Like if the queen of England is coming over for tea, have proper posture, sit up straight, you know, look uh, somebody in the eye and shake their hand. But I understand the same, the, the same idea of, I honestly don't want to give you a guilt trip so that when you are watching Netflix tonight, you think you have to sit in this, you know, Buckingham Palace guard position either. And it's usually not somewhere perfectly in the middle either, because I don't know that there is an ideal middle for resting. It may be closer to the Netflix position, just not all the way slumped kind of down, if that makes sense. So sometimes, you know, you, you tell people this and they just want to quickly go the exact opposite way when really we need to pump the brakes a little bit. And it is nice to relax after a long day. Yeah, absolutely chill. Sit in your favorite chair, plop down on the couch. I don't want to take that away from you. And by the way, doctors, you're not going to. If you, As a younger doctor, I'd be like, you need to have good posture. You need to sit up straight. Dude, you're banging your head into the wall if you think you're going to change that in people. And if they come back and they still have bad posture when you see them in the waiting room, you know, Dude, it's so hard to change another person's behavior. It's so hard to change your own behavior, let alone another person's. But the comfort in this should be that you don't have to get them, like I said, Buckingham Palace, upright and tucked position. Um, usually you need some kind of just little buffer zone there in the middle, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I agree. And I, I mean, I think you're just going to, give them middle back pain to be honest if you tell them right. to sit up straight and it, it's not going to connect to the rest of their body or to the floor or to their legs it's just mm -hmm. you're just telling them to sit up straight by using these middle back erectors that are just going to be extremely tired after three minutes of doing it because normal for them is netflix position and and yeah it doesn't carry over to like the true stability that that we're actually looking for on the previous uh, podcast, we had an awesome talk with Dr. Askey, and he was talking about when you, the, that, that we're holding ourselves up basically with calves and a core and our vision. And if you take away the vision and then you stimulate the calves to make them feel like um, the person 
is falling forward. So basically like it feels like the calf is lengthening. They will, if they have poor stability at their core and in their spine, like multifidus, they will start to lean back because they feel like they're falling forward when they're actually not. And that's kind of what I mean. Like that ability to use the system to find stability, sitting up straight is not going to accomplish that. Uh, and I don't know how well anybody can accomplish it because the only person who can accomplish it is the patient. Right. And, and that takes a motivated patient and a trusting patient and a very good clinician that's going to educate them on how, and there's no guidelines for this. There's no research that tells us how to fix posture. You know what I mean? So, right. No, I, but I'm, you know, there are, and there are ways I do think even going back to that study that, uh, Dr. Askey kind of was kind of referencing about those three zones of where we're getting our appropriate section. How do you know where you are in space? Obviously the eyes are a big one and then your core kind of, uh, multifidi and then your calves were kind of the big centers of how your body identifies where it is in space. And if you're going into that Netflix position, you are essentially turning off a, your, your core, you're putting your multifidi in just a rough position to do anything. And, and then of course your eyes are locked into some, you know, blue light thing that's, you know, keeping you awake all night or whatever. But so, I mean, in that sense, one of the, the, the fixes and this again, shoot, we'll just keep stealing from, from Nick from the last episode is thoracic rotation or rotation of the spine in general. Can you rotate? And, and this is not really getting away from the shoulder at all, because I think what happens a lot in shoulder injuries, and, I, and I'll say this to patients as well, the shoulder, most people, most patients will think is the arm. They'll say, I have a shoulder problem, and they will point to their arm, you know, the front of their humerus, right? When the shoulder complex as we know it is of course the shoulder the shoulder blade and, and the rib cage all together and those are just kind of the structural parts of it let alone the muscular components uh you could include the spine of course with that but oftentimes the shoulder is doing way too much and we don't get that what you're kind of talking about your shoulder blade and your rib cage mechanics a little bit more in line so to kind of what nick was saying about the multifidi and about the abdomen and thoracic rotation is that if we can create a, a bit more variability in your rib cage and your scapula if via rotating left and right that will start to let them pull more of the weight if you will and and kind of let the arm or the as people would say the shoulder you know take less of the load is that is that fair to say? Yeah, and I think people will probably notice one side that they like to rotate towards and another side that they won't. And that could explain why one side <laughs> is having a shoulder issue uh, or possibly both. But, but it could explain something. You can see these large asymmetries. Just think of if you only aired up, you know, half of, you know, the, only the tires on the right side of your car. I just you know, and you can't be surprised that you're having a big, a bit of an auto issue, not too far down the road. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I and, mean, why, why are people having unilateral one-sided shoulder pain with say, you know, we'll, we'll stick to kind of CrossFitters. I can figure out kind of why my, you know, my guy who's trimming the tree and stuff like that might, um, but CrossFitters are, you know, you're, they're not, it's not a lot of uh, kettlebell, single arm kettlebell overhead stuff, the snatch and presses and overhead squats. That's, that's two arms. But then for some reason, one of the arms, you know, tends, it, that's, do you find that, that one, one arm tends to get hurt rather than both on bilateral kind of lifts, symmetrical yes. lifts, asymmetrical injuries? Where, what are we missing here? Probably unilateral lifting, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, just just to throw a curveball in there i think i think you know I, i've said this before on here you don't fix an overhead squat with an overhead squat and i think these bilateral exercises are really a, not effective at addressing these inconsistencies or asymmetries in strength or mobility or position or whatever side to side so when you do something that's two-legged or two-handed you you better be able to do things somewhat equal on both sides. 
because otherwise you're going to have torque because if you're stiff on one side and you're not stiff on the other, you're going to start, you're going to twist and it's going to create torque and that's going to create compression or friction or overloading or, um, yeah, asymmetrical tightening of certain muscles and lengthening of other muscles. So, I mean, I'm not surprised at all that a bilateral exercise is going to yield a, a you know, you know, a one-sided shoulder issue and it's going to break wherever the most strain and stress and torque or whatever the problem is, uh, first. So it could, I mean, if they just, you know, if we just kept numbing it with a injection every day, they could develop the other one as well. Uh, because, sure. because chances are the other shoulder is not perfectly in position either if they're torqued uh but it's going to break or tear or strain or inflame first where the most the most uh friction is for sure yeah i mean so <clears throat> would you say that that torque is in your i mean it's hard to say precisely the 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 scapula torque or the torque through the let, let's just say the shoulder of the three things the arm the shoulder blade the rib cage and spine <clears throat> obviously impingement is shoulder impingement in the arm right mm -hmm. but where do you see kind of the bigger falls where people might be able to clean it up uh more quickly probably probably the spine and the rib cage to be honest yeah. if, if you just kept these you know if you imagine those rotating you know, an anatomy programs on, on the internet where you can see the skeleton in front of you. And if you just kept the shoulder blades and the arm and the arms and, you know, took your cursor and got rid of everything else. So they're just two arms and shoulder blades floating there. And if those, just imagine that those are stationary and your rib cage and your spine is moving left and right underneath those two appendages, right? As that rib cage and spine turns to the left, it's going to have a different kind of um, approximation and contact and everything else with the left side compared to the right side. And typically we, we don't let our arms hang dead. Like when we walk, we swing those arms. So they have this unique relationship with a, a spine and a thorax and a rib cage that's turning one way while arms are swinging the other way. Um, and that, that keeps the pattern normalized. And the problem is, is when you can't alternate that situation, maybe you can't rotate at all in your spine. In that case, we have a problem because with the spine and the rib cage don't rotate, you don't swing your arms. When you don't swing your arms, we go back to John's, you know, compression, decompression stuff or DNS and PRI type stuff where people are not able to relieve pressure. They're just constantly tight because you need to rotate rotation is torque but it, rotation is also the release of torque right um you can put your hand in your shirt and twist it up as far as you can till that shirt twists around your fist and becomes tighter and tighter and tighter or just like squeezing a towel of water out you twist it and twist it till the water forces out it's torque one direction but as you rotate it the other way you derotate it and you release torque so this this has to be occurring all the time and a, a thorax or a, 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 a carapace, if you will, underneath those, those appendages, not being able to um, either approximate the shoulder blades, either it will rotate side to side, stuck in a certain position, extended position, flat T-spines, whatever it is, doesn't allow this harmonious uh, relationship to occur with the shoulder blade. I mean, how would you answer your own question? Because that's a, that's a cool question. I've never been asked that directly, so I kind of like it. Yeah, no, I was going to ask you that indirectly. But I mean, the, the idea of torque too, I mean, these are some basic principles that, I mean, we've kind of talked about a long time ago with open chain and closed chain, where there are certain joints, and you've probably seen this on the internet, some say mobile, the next say stable, they kind of alternate. But then when you change your position, other joints should be stable and other joints should be mobile. So for instance, let's just stick with, you know, let's just say a, a snatch, right? Again, um, if you are moving your arms up over your head, they should have a stable base to cr create torque off of. Now, if that base, and you kind of alluded to this earlier in terms of like filling up one side of the tires in your car, if like only the right side, now you might be like, hey, my steering wheel, it keeps pulling to the left for some reason. And of course your steering wheel is pulling to the left, 
but is that the main reason? You're like, do I need to get a new steering wheel? Actually, those tires need to be aligned. So if your arms are, you're lifting your arms up on an unstable or pre-torqued kind of base almost, you want to kind of imagine, then you are at, those arms are going to have to retorque, if you will, to kind of compensate for that. Uh, and so making sure it's very hard. We were kind of talking about with posture, resting all the way in flexion or resting all the way in extension. Now, obviously we're three dimensional beings. So sometimes there's a side bend one way or the other. Sometimes there's an extension in the side bend. There's extension side bend in a rotation. It's really hard to kind of pick those things apart. So just getting a base level of really increasing that thoracic rotation will hopefully widen the ability for your arms to create torque off of that kind of thoracic base, basically. Um, and that's where that comes, comes in. I, I think that's how I'd like to answer that. How do you like to, to test uh, or appreciate thoracic rotation? Man, there are a lot of ways. Uh, it depends on kind of the population too, because sometimes I really want them to feel their thoracic rotation is limited because it, it always is in one form or fashion. There's, it's never perfect side to side. Um, I used to test it uh, SFMA style in the very beginning, kind of seated. They'd have maybe something between their knees so their hips couldn't rotate. And uh, they just put their hands on their shoulders and kind of twist. Sometimes we put a little PVC pipe ac across their collarbone, almost like a front rock position. Um, a lot of times people, for whatever reason, even though it seems obvious to me, couldn't feel that themselves and so you know they don't this goes back to recognizing your patients and getting your patients to become more aware of their issues and their dysfunctions you have to have almost a deadbolt test to that where they can tell you that's positive or that's negative if they aren't telling me they notice a difference and i have to be like Ooh, look you're a couple centimeters off the left to the right and i have to kind of sell them on their tests I'm already behind the eight ball, I feel like, and I'm making up ground. Um, but sometimes for general population, I can get away with that test. <laughs> that said, um, a lot of times we'll, we'll do, this is more of a, a Leon Chetau version, where he puts his hands on the neck and they've tried to bring their elbows together in front of their chest. Now, that also includes those shoulder blades kind of coming around as well you're gonna to have to get a little bit of flexion through there to get there so sometimes in general population you won't be able to people won't even be able to do that position then let's just say they can do that position keep your elbows together and then kind of rotate over to your left and then over to your right and as soon as those elbows come apart then we know the test is kind of done because you've lost some intrinsic shoulder stability with your thoracic rotation and that's a little bit more obvious and uh continuous i would say from patient to patient and also it just gives them a good mark because that is actually a pretty good test you'll get some that that nasty rhomboid pain that people get and they're just like it's just bad through there and please massage it for me basically uh and i go here's a lacrosse ball have a nice day right uh no i'm kidding but getting people to pull those shoulder blades actively together pu pulling your elbows together and then twisting seems to be the most um consistent for me at least how, how do you how do you test it more like the one you mentioned first but I, yeah with your second idea or the chaitao version mm -hmm. um it, it could be i could see a positive and a negative to it and the positive i think would be if they truly can't protract and they can't protract a, a, a scapula and retract a rib cage then it'll be quite obvious the deficit that they have and it's you're kind of salt you're kind of checking that as well with the rotation um but the only thing would be is if they don't usually if they don't use a protracted or a flexion strategy to accomplish rotation maybe it's giving them maybe a false negative but i i think i think that's a good idea i think i i want to play around with that a little bit because if they can do it if they can protract the shoulder blades and you know flex or, or retract the rib cage in the spine a little bit mm -hmm. then then they do have the capacity maybe they just have a poor strategy but that's that's a totally different problem right 
Right. No. Yeah. I mean, in that test, I, you can, I'll weed out too. Like sometimes he does a little bit more passively going to one side and then extending. So they'll grab the back of their hand. They pull, bring their elbows together in front of their chest. And then you have them rotate, you kind of cut their elbows, help them rotate, and then give them a little bit of extension one way, rotate and give them an extension. This is Chetau. This is required reading if you're uh, on the British Isles, apparently, or anything. <laughs> the, the Europeans got, have Chetau down way better than we do, but he's got some magical stuff. So, and this, again, one of my test things, like the test is an exercise, the exercise is a test. Part, like, sometimes if I go through a battery of tests and I start to work on that thoracic extension he also has one and i've seen i know levinson uses this um craig levinson and he kind of got it from yonda and the Prague school as well where they'll do one side where they'll put one hand behind and the other one will rest and then they'll twist and just do one side extension so they can get some mid thoracic extension kind of uh, I would say like T3, T8, kind of through that area. You can almost kind of palpate and extend. Uh, they do a little bit of PNF, you know, once they have a main uh, extension, they'll say push your elbow forward, kind of flex forward. And they'll do that a time or two. And you can get some pretty quick extension uh, in the mid thoracic spine that way. Um, I don't really do those techniques, to be honest with you. Uh, they seem very transient in terms of how long they stay. But it, it does give me, it's a pretty obvious test in terms of if I twist a person, then have them extend, you'll feel a pretty hard stop and they'll, they'll feel it as well, which is, like I said, my thing. They'll go to the other side and be able to extend a little bit better. Um, and, it, and especially with some of the technique stuff I do, the retest is always pretty good. Um, make, sure you're, <laughs> make sure your retest is good. Um, anyways. But yeah, that, that, I will add a little bit of extension there. And that really highlights, especially if there's some crossfitter who's just like, I need you to beat up my anterior delt and my pack today. Please just rip it to shreds. I'm like, oh, there's probably some other stuff we need to check on. Mm -hmm. But I got to prove to you first that that is what you need. And these kind of Chetau versions usually let me into that. Yeah, that's good. I think there's also dynamic ways to check to check this and maybe it's good to start with some of these more, I mean, simple or straightforward rotations, like can they, simple, can their body allow it? And when John said, put something between the knees, like squeeze it. So that way it kind of stabilizes it. But then if it doesn't seem too bad, you might want to do some type of analysis, whether it's gait or something like a retro stare we've talked about in the past where you're asking them to do an activity that kind of requires rotation in order for you to accomplish it well. A single leg task where you're reaching, uh, reaching a, a leg one way and a, you know, the arms the other way. Some kind of, there's like, there's like lateral hops. There's different things you can do where dynamically you can assess their, either their ability to access that motion if they have it or if they're using it at all. Even simple gait will tell you sometimes if they're sure. if they're rotating but i like the uh the only other one that's a little bit more dynamic that i'll use and i'll immediately translate it into an exercise if i'm like i gotta work on your thoracic rotation i don't know honestly the first time i saw it where it was but anyways uh, imagine a person is standing uh perpendicular to the wall and they'll they're putting they're going to put both their arms straight forward ahead of them reaching they'll put the outside of say their right shoulder on the wall. And I'll kind of have them in, in gait. So if your right arm is forward, we'll put your right foot back. We'll just kind of do the opposite, right? And so you have to have both your arms forward, your, your right, kind of the back and outside of your right shoulder will stay on the wall. And you need to reach your arm, your opposite arm, so your left arm, back as far as you can. You've probably seen these kind of open the book mm -hmm. uh, stretches and exercises. But I do think the trick is to create some sort of stable point, mobile point, so that they know that, look, okay, you could probably twist pretty far back, but if that right shoulder comes off of the wall, that's when the test stops. Or like when the elbows come apart, that's when you're done. So you give them that kind of metric. The other thing is that a lot of times with these book openers, uh, I see a lot of times on social media or YouTube or whatever, people are really working on the opening up part of it. 
Let's not forget also that when that right arm is on the wall, that that left arm needs to also reach forward. And so sometimes that right shoulder on the wall, the left arm reaching forward, doesn't reach as far forward. So can they rotate left and right under a stable right side? That would be the very specifics of this thoracic rotation. And then again, do that on the other side. So can you pin your left shoulder to the wall, reach as far forward and reach as far back as you maintain that kind of pinned left shoulder on the wall. And there's always, always an obvious deficit left to right. Mm. And sometimes if you just have them do that another dozen times, you can kind of crank and, and loosen it up. Um, but again, those two kind of factors, keep that shoulder on the wall, um, have some stable point to reference basically. Yeah. You can also do that one side lying on, on the floor. And a lot of people will take the top knee and bend it up to 90 degrees and put it on a foam roller. And then they'll yeah. press the, they'll adduct that knee down into the foam roller, creating mm -hmm. stability while they open the book, so to say. You could right. do the, you could still do the reach and everything with the left arm, and then open up and and turn. Yeah, but I like that. Good. I like that. I like that knee on the because I mean the only other thing in terms of standing is if we put them in an athletic stance where like their knees are a little bent because the other part is you'll see that they won't line up their shoulder over their hips, mm. so they'll flex forward or they'll extend. They won't extend back. Usually they're overextended in their spine. They're arching their back essentially. But if you were to say, put your shoulder on the wall and you were to draw a line, a plumb line, right down, down the lateral side of the body, that shoulder would be well ahead of their hip mm. on that same side. And so you're like, hold on, let me just kind of shove you backwards, which is kind of what we're talking about, shifting that spine backwards. So that's another kind of eye opening thing typically for them as well. But if you do it on the ground, I like that because that almost immediately rules out that overextension or overflexion of the low back and hips um that works well too yeah well we can get back to shoulders a little bit even though we're still talking about shoulders if you, if you can't are. tell <laughs> but we wanted to hit a little bit on impingement and there's different types of impingement right there's there's uh subacromial impingement there's posterior impingement or inner internal impingement which i've actually seen a a fair bit of uh, and uh, there's also subcoracoid impingement which is a little more rare and probably hard to diagnose but you can definitely read about it um, if you want to know more about that a lot of times it's a subscap I believe that gets pinched in there but I mean I'm assuming you see subacromial impingement most often but maybe talk about those first two and you know what that what that means for one uh, we'll kind of start easy and then delve back into some of the reasons why it's occurring. Uh, and then, so I would say that superior impingement to the subacromial and then also in, internal impingement posteriorly. Jeez, man, all that just now. Okay. <laughs> you, you got no, so like the, the super, go ahead. Now you're, you're good. This is, you went over here and you did a whole, you're going to go do a seminar. Let me just give you the notes for it really quick. Uh, no, I'm kidding. The superior is probably, I think, the, mo the most consistent for me, honestly. Uh, reaching up overhead and then a ah, pinch on the top of my shoulder. Uh, that's for sure. So one of the, the there's an easy test for, retest for this, uh, though. So if you bring, you reach your arm up overhead, you oftentimes will see that the shoulder blade and the clavicle kind of will hike up with it. Their shoulder is getting closer to their ear, right? So very quick, I mean, without load, they're like, yep, there's the pinch on top right there. Kind of maybe a little bit anterior on top. And maybe it's only anterior because they're kind of tilted forward, by the way. Um, but I will, to really kind of rule this out and also demonstrate what I need to do, I'll put my hand on the top of their shoulder and kind of depress and almost drop that shoulder back as then they lift their shoulder up again. And if it is a good superior impingement, oftentimes that impingement goes away. And so that'll kind of show that like, oh, hold on, that didn't pinch that time. Got it. And so what does that tell us? This is some of that shoulder retraction, depression stuff that we were kind of talking about. We need to bring that shoulder back down essentially, right? And so that's a really quick kind of clearance way that I like to uh, tease out that uh, superior impingement at least. And that lets them kind of know well, okay, he, he understands my injury. He knows where we're, we're kind of going with this. Um, what was that second one? 
Posterior impingement. Posterior impingement. Posterior impingement usually happens when, for me, I see the posterior rotator cuff just kind of die. Like there is just no muscle mass back there at all. And so we can go back to this kind of rounded shoulder position. Those guys, those retractors, I mean, we could even say the post, it's posterior rotator cuff is just not awake. Like those guys have been put in a bad position, typically for a long period of time. They're watching Netflix, they're on their phone, they're hammering out Excel spreadsheets. And those muscles have just been elongated and you can say atrophied, honestly, at this point. And then they go to reach backwards or something like this because the, co- the kids, the coods, the kids are goofing off in the back seat or something like that. Or, you know, they reach back for something and then they get that pinch in the back of their shoulder. Um, which kind of seems a little bit ant- uh, antithetical to when we talk about the humerus kind of popping out of the front of the shoulder. Why does it start to pinch when you go back? And it's just, it's hard to kind of vis- uh, visualize mechanically, honestly, for me. But essentially, you want to think about the head of your humerus is not shifting back into socket as well. It is staying forward and you are just kind of extending your arm. So it's almost like the back of that humoral head is starting to pinch rather than it translating back into the socket as everything rolls back. Now, that's basically kind of what we were talking about earlier, where I said your shoulder complex is three things, and you are abusing just the arm portion of that rather than r- rotating your spine back or rotating the other side of the spine, thorax forward, uh, getting that shoulder blade to get out of the way, and then reaching backwards. I kind of have a, a visual that could help, uh, I think. I've often thought about the, sh- you know, I've used the golf tee and golf ball analogy often for mm-hmm. shoulders, but if you take the, you know, the, the shoulder blade and we tip it 90 degrees so that the, that the glenoid is facing up like a golf tee and we sit the head of the humerus on top of it like a golf ball. Now let's just say that the golf ball, it, it, it couldn't do this because of the shape of a golf tee and a golf ball. But if we were to shift the let's say we could just take our fingers and grab the golf ball and slide it forward on the tee so that it's kind of hanging over the front of the tee. And so therefore in the back of the golf tee, there's a part of that concave uh, tee that's now visible. It's, it's open. Now, if you were to take your, you know, take your finger and put it on that little spot and now take the golf ball and rotate it backwards, it's going to basically pull and pinch your finger right into that little gap. So this, this shoulder is being grabbed and drug forward based on imbalances that John's already described. And then you go reach back and it doesn't have this, it's not centered. It's not centrated like we've discussed with hips in the past. So yeah, it's got that little area where you can, you can get an impingement. And sometimes you can get both, to be honest, because if that humerus is gliding forward, now it's also, you know, it's tractioning the biceps tendon. It's traction, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it migrates superiorly as well as anteriorly. So you just hit stuff sooner than you should. I mean, I know there's some research and there's some like, there's no such thing as shoulder impingement people out there. Did you, did you know this? Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fine. But, sure. and they say that there's no such thing because there's always impingement when you go overhead. Well, that's, that's true, I guess, but there's still varying degrees of friction and compression. And that's sure. all, that's all we're talking about. No, absolutely. And, and yeah. And so one of the things too, I want to try to do with this as well is g- give an idea uh, of kind of some strategies as well to kind of fix this. So one of the things is uh, specifically uh putting that golf ball back on the tee, right? The idea of doing that is where you want to go. And there are uh, some deeper concepts with this, but there are some, we'll go back to the Che Tao stuff. If the, the test was, um, you know, putting your hands on your shoulders, elbows together, and then twisting. If you've, if you've found that, say, the, let's say just your right shoulder has some impingement on it, One of the things I want to do, if you have, again, your hand on your neck and you say your right elbow is going forward um, in that position, and we've kind of got a little bit of shoulder depression, what you'll basically do is take your opposite hand, push on the inside of the elbow. 
And so basically when your right shoulder is in kind of a neutral position forward, pushing your elbow into your hand, your hand into your elbow, and that will essentially kind of lock in whatever position you have there, right? So you will contract some things. And then once you've contracted that, I'll have you then go again and twist back into the right. So you've got your right shoulder, right elbow up, left arm is pushing on the inside of the elbow, and then you're twisting back into the right. And with that contraction, you will immediately start to kind of shift because you've captured the humoral head. You'll push that humoral head posteriorly into the socket. And a lot of times you'll immediately start to feel that posterior rotator cuff, almost like the sleeper stretch kind of thing that, that you see a lot, a lot of times on the internet, right? Uh, but it's a little bit more of an active and safe way to kind of go about that. Uh, a lot of times people can't do it with their arm up at 90. So if you kind of bring your arm down to about chest height, a little bit lower than that, right? Pushing your elbow in and then kind of rotating back, almost very quickly you'll start to feel some subscap and lats kind of pull in. But what that is essentially doing is putting what Bobby's kind of talking about with the golf ball and the tee, shoving that humoral head, uh, that golf ball into the tee, and then moving it back into pushing that humoral head posteriorly, which it where it typically is not. Um, and sometimes just a couple little rounds of that will at least wake up some of the posterior structures of the shoulder where the patient can get, and this is I'm back to general population, where if, as long as sometimes if they just feel that posterior rotator cuff wake up a couple times. Now they need to do it more, of course, but just doing that will get some of that posterior side to wake up um, and it can kind of very quickly centrate the humoral head and get some kind of quick relief, I empowering the patient back. Like, Look, you can do this yourself. This isn't going to take two years of Ido Portal jumping off tables and breaking his own ankles to fix. Um, what were those last two types though? Or was it one left? Uh, it was just subcoracoid impingement. Oof. So we Oof. can skip that one. Oof. You don't Bro. see it very, you don't see it very yeah. often. Um, yeah, but in the, with the golf ball analogy too, I'll often explain yeah. how the golf ball, we want that golf ball to be able to spin and rotate in any direction, three, you know, three dimensional on that golf tee without ever falling off the tee. Like that's the, and that's what the rota rotator cuff does primarily. It's, it's, it's kind of a weak rotator honestly I and mean, they're not that strong so their main job is to hold that centered position in the in the golf tee if you will um but i want to throw in some variables because sure. this is again this is that idea of math is easy until they change the the variables and now it's hard again so sure. if you're like with the posterior impingement example you're saying they got a weak posterior rotator cuff sometimes it could be one reason and but I can see how if you give them some I's, Y's, and T's, they could get worse. So sometimes, I mean, do we need, sometimes we have to inhibit things before we can turn things on because that, that shoulder has not, unless you did what John just described, a, a little bit of a recentering activity, that thing is still out of position. So you can't just go attack that posterior rotator cuff, right? So what do we need, what do we need to think about uh, inhibiting before we can retrain that yeah no i see what you're saying i've seen plenty of people butcher those i's y's and t's fantastic exercises but if you start in the wrong position i mean you can just still kind of piss off a shoulder as well right um but yeah that's and that's why we're kind of talking about obviously load capacity and skill are incredibly important things but even prior to that is the baseline position so if you start to build up load capacity and skill in your our Netflix position, right, then you're just getting better at, at a bad position. You're just strengthening up a, a, a bad thing. This is a lot of times what we, I, I, Dr. Askey and I used to have this debate. We were talking about those big Swiss balls. People are like, I just need to get it. This is before standing desk went crazy. I'm just going to get a Swiss ball at my desk and then I'll be working my core all day and I'll be answering calls and I'm just going to be bouncing best core ever. And I'm like, well, really all you're doing is strengthening up your bad posture. You're just reinforcing that bad thing. 
So before before you start eating these things, and look, bodybuilders know this better than anybody. You start in the right position, and then you add load to it. This is that's Schwarzenegger 101, right? That is basic lifting 101. So I honestly wish a lot of clinicians might take some cues from our power lifter friends, our bodybuilder friends, even that they will start that position. Now they go hyper a little bit after that. They might go a little bit crazy after that, but initially, man, they will put their shoulder in a centrated position. You're not moving heavy weight without a shoulder in a good spot and they will lock it in and then load. If you ever see anybody lifting deadlifting or squatting heavily, man, they take their time. They're set up on the bar first. You could probably get into this more, but it is the same idea when you're going into these I's, Y's, and T's. You're not lifting heavy weight, but even if it's just the, the, your yellow bands or the little pink weights that we have at the clinic, you're still going to annoy something if you don't start in the right position. Is that fair? Oh, yeah. And if they're, I mean, if they're not cognizant of their core activity the whole time they're on a ball, I honestly think you might make them worse because you took away their only support that they do have. A lot of those people give them a chair with a back and tell them to use the back of their chair. Don't lean right. forward towards the monitor. Like, use the chair. Like, lean back into it. Yeah. You're at least in a pseudo anatomical position, but being supported by a chair. And right. it may not fix their posture, but I bet it lowers their symptoms compared to a, a, the Swiss ball idea. For um, sure. But yeah, I mean, position is huge too. I mean, I can imagine some low backs that'll get flared up by doing eyes, Y's and T's as well, or necks. <laughs> oh, you get, you'll get it re really angry. Yeah. Are you targeting the back of the shoulder? Absolutely. But I mean, to, to make that happen and people will make it happen. They think they need to do it. They'll overextend the neck. They'll clench their jaw. You know, they'll extend their low back uh, to make those things happen. And so find exercises if, if, if the appropriate circumstances start off in the first place, I think. I th this is a really good one, I think, for people to envision that you, can, you could create harm. You could do a bad thing. You could give them an I, Y, and T prone on the floor uh, to help their issue. But if you don't mention anything about keeping your core engaged while you do it, you could tell them something simple, like put a towel underneath their forehead and tell them to push their forehead down into the towel and make sure they feel their core while they do it. Just that cue alone, well, A, it will increase the EMG activity to the posterior shoulder just right there because you are now taking out some of the lat and some of the low back and some of these big movers that are actually bringing the arm into extension and horizontal abduction and you are you are putting that stimulus into the back of the shoulder the more things we can do is where we can stabilize the system and then move on it uh we can we can start to retrain these patterns so keeping keeping the core on and not keeping the core on allows other things to to be moved by thing by something other than the lumbar spine or the, the low back and T-spine musculature, these strong extensors that if I see something too common, it's that. I see people with bodybuilding lumbar muscles who don't bodybuild. And, and, I, and I see this as a bad thing, honestly. I, say, I'd love, I mean, I love your muscles look awesome, but you shouldn't have upper traps and low back or TL junction, thick, huge muscles if you have, if you've never lifted a weight in your life, but right. that, that, that muscle is now your prime mover and you might, yeah, I would not be surprised that those individuals have some shoulder impingement or headaches and neck pain. Right. Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to the, you know, we we're talking about thoracic rotation. You need to, you need to lock down as many kind of factors. You have the thing squeezing between their knees or have their shoulder on a wall. It's kind of the same motif of if you're going to move those shoulders back, in those I's, Y's, and T's, you wanna make sure that there's a stable center to move off of. And so as a clinician, if you're in that clinical setting, you need the, 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 the firing of the core that you're talking about is kind of locking down the core, the rib cage, the back, such that the arm can then extend and abduct kind of appropriately on a, on a good base. But you can't, I think it's a big mistake that a, a lot of times we assume that the base 
is stable. The ground is stable most of the time if you're in a CrossFit gym. Hopefully like the bottom of your shoes are pretty even. But then after that, everything that you're assuming is stable is strictly an assumption from that point on. Uh, it either needs to be made stable, but and especially if you're in a clinical setting, you need to make sure that whatever, if that arm is moving, that that thorax is nice and stable. Otherwise, you know, people will be like, oh, I feel my upper trap. I, you know, I feel my neck working. Um, and this is usually like, you're doing it wrong. Um, uh, the externally rotate or, you know, but it, it, it has to do with getting that base stable and then moving off of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, and these things sound easy, but to, for example, for a winging shoulder blade, for them to feel a lower trap in isolation, oh man, that is hard. They're going to have to work yeah. extremely hard. They're going to have to have serratuses on at the same time that they have a lower trap. They're going to have to hold their abs on. They're going to have to, you know, inhibit a lat somehow at the same time. It's going to be really tough. So we say these things, but sometimes it's really complicated. But, yeah. and sometimes you have overt stability coming from these prime movers that won't allow this good motion. So if we go back to the lat and use this extension idea. Mm -hmm. So I said, when people are overextended, that spine and rib cage is kind of moving forward away from the shoulder blades. And that extension actually gives leverage to the lat. It, it puts it in a more shortened position and the lat's an internal rotator and it's a big one and it's a strong one and it'll pull that shoulder off the golf tee and it'll rotate the arm in. And, and if that's the case and you can't get that thing to shut off or you can't raise an arm without it staying on, it's going to impact that ability to cleanly have a, a humeral head that can roll, spin, and glide on that glenoid cleanly and just because you have one guy right there that's restricting it. So using something like a, a wall serratus reach or something is a really good way to retract the shoulder the rib cage the whole thorax and reaching forward will push that spine backwards which will lengthen the lat and it, and you can do some different things with positions of your elbows and arms and i'm sure this is where i like i like john on this stuff because he's always creative with finding ways to to uh nuance things and and, and tease out uh, exactly what he's trying to find from a from a from a movement but in this activity you might I'm just making this one up right now because we're talking about posterior impingement, but you could get into that serratus wall serratus press and then try to hold that position with, let's say the opposite arm pressing into the wall, keeping your abs on, everything is stable and then pick that arm off the wall and try to reach backwards. And I, it's going to be hard, especially if you're that winging scapula, but then they might say, wow, this is hard, but I feel that back of my shoulder or rhomboid lower trap area just burning like crazy and then it's a much more effective exercise than prone tees without any other um without any other guidance yeah 100 percent. yeah no i couldn't agree more in terms of you're talking about positioning the rib cage inhibiting a lat trying to inhibit a pec it's really hard even on that serratus uh, exercise when you know and that's a good one you know reaching onto the wall and seeing if people still use a pec or not. Uh, and very commonly you will see they'll reach their elbows forward and that pec is bouncing out with them. Um, it's tough. It's not easy getting a shoulder in the right position. I'll say it's not easy to get an arm in the right position, but if you can start to think a little bit more broadly in terms of shoulder blade, rib cage, and the interplay between those two and how they all kind of work together, You'll start to you'll start to catch more of this stuff and be able to correct a little bit more quickly. I think. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. Sweet. Maybe we're we gonna have to get over point. shoulders again, man. There's yeah, so much with shoulders. I I still want to go into. I think there are plenty of concepts here today, though, that we kind of dove into: stable, moving, turn some things off before you turn them on, pinching mm -hmm. in the wrong places some weird tests that we just made up on the spot, but plenty of stuff you can use in the clinic, hopefully, uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, but thanks for listening to this uh, episode.